The 3D models in this video were made by Kuzim, or Adam Midzuk, and the animations were made by Tyler Addison. Their socials will be included in the description and the comment section below. The Cambrian Explosion was the singular major event that saw the origin of most of the major groups of life on Earth. Many of these major groups have survived to today, and many have not. But there are always many gaps in the fossil record of the evolution of many of these groups. I'm not talking about arthropods or vertebrates, I'm talking more general and major than that. All living things share a common ancestor after all. We belong to the superphylum Deuterostomia. It is defined as all organisms that develop their anus before their mouth during embryonic development. Under this definition, that includes chordates, hemichordates, echinoderms, and a few mysterious groups of now extinct animals. That's a lot of critters. Insights have been made into the early members of these groups and their evolution, but not the common ancestor type organisms that began to diverge into these other groups. One possible member of this exclusive common ancestor club was described in 2017 as Saccharitis coronarius, and it's nothing short of horrifying. No, this isn't a disembodied head. Any similarity is our brain trying to find patterns that aren't there. Microfossils are some of the most important things to be recorded in the fossil record. This is especially true of organisms dating to the Cambrian period and before. Life started out on the molecular level, and then the microscopic, before getting bigger and bigger. The Zhangjiajiao section of a layer of rock named the Quanchuan Pu Formation located in Shanxi, China, is home to a bunch of these microscopic fossils, which date back to 535 million years ago. Among the shells or tests of miniature animals were found 45 phosphatized specimens of a really bizarre form of bean-shaped animal. You can't really prepare these kinds of fossils in the same way you would a dinosaur bone. You have to bring an entire chunk of rock back to the lab, crush it up, locate the little black specks, and then find them under a microscope. Once you've located the little things, you have to carefully peel back some of the rock so you can photograph and scan the microfossils. In the case of the 45 specimens that would be named Saccharitis, the fossils themselves are up to 1.3 millimeters in length. They were semi-ellipsoidal in shape, and although some of the fossils were crushed, many were not and allowed a near three-dimensional image of the entire body. Those uncrushed fossils showed the animals were bilaterally symmetric, with their bodies divided into two identical halves. Its bag-like shape is what gave it its name. Saccus means bag, Ritus means wrinkle, and then the species name Coronarius means crowned. The bean-shaped body is perforated by one big hole on the belly side. The hole is ringed by four or so nodulate ridges with a bunch of folds. The folding indicates that anus of a mouth hole could distend from the body. That means the mouth hole basically opened up to eat small things as well as potentially large things. The innermost mouth ring's folds bear a series of oral protrusions, each consisting of an outer sheath and an inner peg-like structure. These protrusions may be some form of sensilla or sensitive areas that help the animal feel around. Above the mouth hole are eight sphincter-like cones called body cones. Those ridges around them are called radial folds and may suggest the body cones were able to shrink and grow. Two sets of small circular openings can be observed on the body. One of those sets is spaced widely apart and near each of the eight body cones. These holes may have served a sensory function or an excretory one by squirting out mucus or gametes. The other set of holes are on the dorsal side of the animal and are arranged in an array. These holes may have housed a set of bristles the creature could use to move around or sense its surroundings. I mean, the thing had no eyes, so it needed to feel around somehow. Below the mouth are two pairs of spines. 
The purpose of these spines is unclear, but I doubt it was protection as only four were preserved. The last of the very bizarre features of this mini beast is the lack of anus. That's right, that anus looking thing is just a mouth and there's no other hole for the waste to come out of. So how did it do it? What does this mean for what kind of animal it is? The research team who described these microfossils, Zhan Han, Simon Conway Morris, Chang Ouyu, Degan Shu, and Wai Huang, hypothesized that the mouth may have been both the in and the out of the animal. It would engulf its prey, digest, and then barf out anything it couldn't digest. The other hypothesis explaining the lack of anus is that those body cones may have been the excretory organ. It engulfed a ton of water with its prey, squirted out the extra water from the body cones, then excreted any waste from those same cones. The animal's characteristics suggest that it may have had a maobenthic lifestyle. Something is maobenthic when it lives in, on, or near the bottom of any body of fresh or salt water. They are also grouped together based on size, as they are larger than microfauna and smaller than macrofauna. In the case of Saccharitis, its body plan was suited to living in the sand at the bottom. Using its thick but flexible cuticle for protection against being squashed, it could wriggle its way through grains of sand. The dorsal set of pores may have allowed the beast to attach itself to the sand as well. The author team found that it was most closely related to the deuterostomes. That's weird. I recall deuterostomes being characterized by an anus, followed by a mouth. I didn't think they only had mouths. In comes a group of early deuterostomes called the Vetulocystids and the Vetulicolians. They were really weird, eyeless, swimming, ravioli creatures with a line of pores along their flanks. The pores and mouth were the main characteristics used to unite these groups with Saccharitis, which was placed in its own series of groups named after it, Saccharitidae and Saccharida. The earliest known deuterostomes have a one-way through gut. That means there was just a single tube connecting the mouth to the anus running through the body. The lack of an anus in Saccharitis may mean it was secondarily lost from an anus carrying common ancestor between it and other deuterostomes. Or the anusless state was inherited from more primitive bilaterian ancestors. Then came a new paper in 2020 by Huan Wan Liu, Hua Chiao Zhang, Jiuquan Xiao, and Bai Xuan Duan. This still in preprint paper described new material of Saccharitis and reinterpreted the animal as belonging to a completely different lineage. This second team also threw some of the fossils under a scanning electron microscope to get amazing images of the fossils. I'm pretty sure the first team did the same thing, but these new fossils look better and more detailed. That could just be because the fossils themselves are better preserved. They found that the mouth was ringed by flattened and triple crowned scales. These scales are interpreted as being part of the integument. The new team also found that the body cones are actually the base for spines that covered the body. They found some specimens with complete spines, meaning the body cones of the first group of specimens were their broken bases. This means that the few pairs of spines near the bottom of the first reconstruction were for defense and that the animal was covered in spiny armor. This also means that the main characteristic used by the first team to place Saccharitis alongside the early deuterostomes, the gill slits or body cones, is no longer viable. So what the hell is this thing then? Turns out the critter is most likely an early form of Ecdysozoan. Ecdysozoa is a superphylum within the protostomia clade, which lies alongside the deuterostomia. Protostomes used to be defined apart from deuterostomes by forming their mouth before their anus, but it turns out that protostomes are far too complex for a simple reverse uno classification. Deuterostomes really are that simple though, so there's that. Anyway, ecdysozoans are the arthropods, you know, insects, chelicerates, crustaceans, millipedes and centipedes, and the nematodes. They are majorly defined as animals that grow through the process of ecdysis molting one's exoskeleton. This means Saccharitis isn't really related to us at all. 
If this interpretation holds up to peer review, that means that Saccharitis represents another notch in the diversity of ectisozoans during the Cambrian that was previously unknown. That also means the search for something that has all the predicted characteristics of a protodeuterostome is still on. What might be found next? Saccharitis merch is now available on the Edge Redbubble. Support my artists and I via links in the description and comment section below. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks goes to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger, as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.